We're now going to turn our attention to classifications of the types of business models that might arise from different constellations of the four choices that guide entrepreneurial strategy. So to recall, you have an idea and you've got several business models. Uh, let me improve the uh, font. So you were trying to choose uh, which one to go ahead with. Uh, to put it in the schema that we've just introduced, here's what it looks like. You notice each of those business models is a different constellation of technology, customers, competition, and identity. The first thing you want to do to identify a business model is find something that is coherent. And by coherent, I mean that these four choices fit together in some way. They sort of drive one another, making it inevitable, uh, the choices in each, and have it reinforce one another. Just to take an example, think about what Amazon.com does. It did when it started. It started off by choosing its customers, books. It was going to sell books over the internet. Then it used specific technology, and its technological choice was to uh, build off the internet uh, pipeline. It was going to be online first, if you will, uh, with technology that allowed them to you know, do things like one-click ordering and stuff like that to make the customer experience online paramount. As part of that, they were, of course, choosing their competition. Now, they could have provided a front end for traditional booksellers, but instead what they chose to do was compete directly with bricks and mortar stores. Again, that was a choice. Made sense because they're online first. They could therefore, why did they have to worry about all this other stuff in the stores? They could concentrate on making the consumer experience on their website first class so no one had to go anywhere near a store. And then this, of course, drove their identity. Their identity was to provide a great selection, which is something bricks and mortar stores couldn't do, to have very low prices, everyday low prices, and to be relentless in the pursuit of that. Okay, So you can see how those choices cohered together. But they also had this focus. They chose one business model over another. You might say, well, what other business model would they have had? Well, their core idea was going to be selling books online. And they chose to do the books, the online search, compete with bricks and mortar, and they have the low prices. But they could have taken these book customers, because it's going to be the same sort of one, and done online ordering instead. Instead of searching for the books, just to order it um, from traditional booksellers. They could have been an agent for those booksellers, and they could have charged a premium for getting books to your door. Okay, so they decided not to do that. It's like they chose the opposite of what was successful with the web van versus Peapod examples. Okay, and they would have faced this choice. And in fact, a whole lot of companies did the uh, left-hand box here rather than the right-hand one. Okay, it turned out the right-hand one combined with a lot of uh, skills, implementation, and all sorts of things, I guess, turned out to be right. So how do you identify these very different business models? Well, the answer is to start with very broad focus, thinking about what you could do this or all that and not both, okay? So let's anchor this with competition, which is a stark choice, okay? When do you compete is one decision you would choose. You might choose to put all your energies into competing now in the hope that you've got some sort of market power later on and can earn back all the money and resources that you've expended competing today. Okay. The alternative choice is to compete, think, consider yourself competing throughout the long term. Okay. Uh, a second choice is, of course, one we've visited quite often. Who do you compete with? Do you compete with the existing established firms? Or do you compete with other startups who are trying to sell to those established firms and be part of their value chain? Let's talk about the when do you compete first. So you could compete today for the market or tomorrow in the market. Examples of competing today is when you secure a patent or you try to have a proprietary network, and we touched on that in the platforms lecture, or you own some key resources. You, or acquire them, for instance. That allows you to have a, a, you know, if you win that battle, to have a monopoly going forward. The alternative is to play tomorrow in the market, not having IP, having open platforms, but making your money in the future on capabilities that are superior to everybody else. It's like standard competitive strategy stuff. Competing today for the market is where you aim at control, control of the market, 
where competing tomorrow in the market is where you compete by executing better than other people. So who do you compete with? You can compete with current incumbents or you can compete with other entry entrants. If you want to compete with the current incumbents, you're thinking about entering the product market, but you better do so in a disruptive kind of fashion, stealth or niche market entry, so that you don't get clobbered by them. You develop assets at the same time, or yourself. You need your own distribution, your own regulation, your own whatever uh, expertise. You can't rely on theirs. When you compete just against other entrants, you will go for a licensing or acquisition strategy with respect to uh, incumbent firms, but it does allow you to scale very quickly because you can leverage their resources through partnerships and things like that. And so we broadly call that competing versus cooperating. Okay, So that's one dimension upon which you choose, and the other of course is the one we just did, control versus execution. That gives you four boxes and four interesting things to think about different business strategies and different models. Let's think about the control versus execution one, because that is least familiar for what we've done thus far in this course. The description is, you know, it's like a patent or a first mover advantage, or in execution you try to get superior product or lower costs or capabilities. Time to market in the control is actually a little bit slower. It takes you a while to get there. It takes a while to get that pattern. It takes a while to build up the things to be a really successful first mover. It just doesn't mean entering the market first. To be a successful first mover, you got to do it in a you know more or less big bang style. Execution is far faster. You can go there. You can iterate. You can learn the market, and you can have minimum viable products and all those things that the lean startup, uh, if you've heard of that, uh, teaches you. Your future returns under control come from you having unique assets that other people can't replicate. Your future returns under execution come from having unique capabilities which are just superior enough to everybody else such that if you're competing with them, you still earn a margin. Some examples of the execution strategy. This is Marco Arment. He invented something, well he actually was co-founder of, uh, yeah, uh, of Tumblr, but he also invented this thing called Instapaper. And his strategy was this. You charge a small amount of money, and that's it, you're done. You don't seek to need to go seek venture capital money, you don't need to sell out your users' privacy, they're not even your users, they're your customers for the first time in a decade. It's great. My goal is never to be dominate, to dominate the market, my goal is to just make a living. And that's essentially what he did. Position the product, it, it, if you've seen it before, you, you click on something and it, it puts a very readable version of an article or web page into a read it later thing on your app, and then it's really easy to read later. Uh, it's a great service, I love it. Uh, and, uh, and it, you know, he wasn't trying to do anything. He wasn't trying to become a content manager, an advertiser, or any other stuff. It was just straight out, I have a product, and I sell it to consumers. Um, eventually, he actually tired of that. He's gone to a new thing called podcasting, a podcasting app. But he sold this one to Betaworks, who essentially are pursuing the same execution strategy. We see some of these different strategies pursued in something a bit more familiar to all of you, and that is mobile and taxi uh, limo services. Lots of people had this idea. All these guys, Uber, Halio, uh, Lyft, and uh, uh, Winston. Winston you wouldn't have heard of. But each of them, initially at least, pursued very different strategies. Okay, uh, Uber was actually very focused on execution, uh, being just better and loved than everyone else, but competing with existing taxi operators. Lyft, on the other hand, are trying to get out of a network, a, a partnership, a community. Actually, you still see that in its identity today. Uh, they're still competing with existing taxi operators, but they were thinking of a community that would be more long-lasting. You could characterize that as control. Halio, um, uh, they used to be in Toronto, they actually since uh, exited, uh, they uh, think about, um, uh, they were executing, but they were cooperating with existing taxi companies, being the mobile app for the existing taxi companies. So they weren't competing, and that saved them all the trouble of worrying about trying to dislodge regulations and things like that. And finally, uh, Winston, uh, uh, Winston was a uh, Next36 one, which basically tried to come up with good software that they could license to taxi companies. Uh, that would hopefully they were hoping would be best in breed for mobile uh, dispatch. Okay. These companies had very different uh, levels of uh, funding as of a few years ago. It keeps changing so much, I can't even update these slides. Uh, these were the funding levels for each of them. 
um, you'll notice that the market and it's continued to, to oops continue to uh, to uh, um, support uh, Uber in this whole battle. Um, but uh, you know those things are changing. Interestingly, Uber have now changed uh, away from that execution and compete focus and moved into the territory of Lyft, not just into their territory, but into their strategy as well. Now they are very much focused on control. So they did actually pivot, uh, especially when around the time they launched UberX, and they're very much of the relentless variety now, but they're also seeking to build up network effects, something as you know we've discussed already as to whether that's a good idea. Okay, so what might we determine these uh, different uh, boxes? Because I think they can be quite useful. They actually all have antecedents in the business literature. For instance, when you compete and you focus on execution, you are following a disruptive strategy. You know, the typical thing, I'm going to be a disruptor. That's what this means, actually. The only thing that's different here is I'm suggesting it's a choice and might not always be the best choice, which is uh, in contrast to what a lot of other people believe. Um, this uh, strategy has competition and execution. You innovate along a new technology tra trajectory. That's something we talked about before. You have a novel value creation for unserved customer con combinations, just as we've talked about before. And uh, the identities pushing on creative distraction, lean experimentation, and lots of hustle, rapid product development, and time to market, and you leverage local talents and local users. To see how a disruption strategy works in practice, let's look at the example that we've discussed before of Netflix. Netflix entered to compete with Blockbuster. Its identity was providing the long tail of viewing. In fact, it didn't have all those new releases in the same way, but it had a great amount of variety. It delivered the customers it was interested in were the ones right in their home. And of course, the technology it chose right at the outset, not of Netflix today, was to base everything on the DVD. Okay, no VHS, just DVD. Okay, and this performed a coherent strategy of a subscription library to DVDs that we discussed last time that was aimed at disrupting what Blockbuster had had. When you cooperate and execute, we call this a value chain strategy. Okay, You're oriented towards collaboration in this case, and you're therefore going to try and integrate old and new technologies together. You still have to have a novel value proposition, but these are directed at their, uh, your customers' end customers. And so you see words like synergy, leveraging scarce talent and capabilities, having a unique core competency, and leveraging access across the value chain so that you can have a bit of a bottleneck position, but able to charge something. That's what you try to go for with a value chain strategy. Um, Halo tried to do this. Okay, What Halo did was it set itself up to its customers were going to be cab co companies and their customers, leveraging off their technology, com not competing with them, and having an identity that the regulations are just great and we can work with it to bring value. Very different from Uber and Lyft. Third sort of strategy is intellectual property. Actually, we kind of touched on this and talked about this in uh, the last lecture. It's where you are oriented towards collaboration but you try to invest in control. You have to have technologies that are generalizable and transferable, and you define your value creation again in relation to existing company customers in the value chain. You're not trying to disrupt anything. So you sometimes hear the word the ideas factory. You have this integrated uh, team of IP managers and investors. Uh, you're thinking about being a new source of complementary innovations and just continuing to supply that. How does this work in a coherent fashion? Well, George Foreman actually did this with the lean, mean, fat, reducing grilling machine. That's a, it was quite a good machine. It sort of has a slope and fat drains off. Very successful IP strategy. He learned much more from licensing this product to an existing manufacturer and then selling it with his brand name attached than anything else. And that's what it is. And his identity was with it. The customers were the customers of that company. The technology was fully developed, but it could be manufactured by other people, and the comp competition was all other players uh, in, in that value chain, but not 
the manufacturers that he was working with. And he, he earned like 10 times what he ever learned from, earned from boxing from this. The final box is the hardest to sort of think about is the architecture strategy. And the architecture strategy uh, has competition and investment in control. You build an ecosystem around a new technology. You define value creation, for, again, for underserved customers. That's what you want to do. It's like the zero to one that Peter Tile talks about. You create some sort of hub in the market. Best example of this, or good example, is eHarmony. eHarmony, in competing on the online dating service, did a different strategy for Match.com. It didn't want all comers. It chose customers who was interested in long-term relationships and had a technology that emphasized people staying and lingering on the site and giving a lot of information. It was competing against the, all those ones, uh, but building up a network from it. And its identity, well, if you read all about the thing, is if you're interested in a long-term marriage, you tend to have a more religious, uh, virtuous identity to you, which is precisely what they have. So there you have it. These are four boxes that you can look at. Um, we'll give you some readings in the next uh, thing about this. Um, but basically, it's all about formulating these strategies, and you can take any idea and think about them in all four of these boxes. But you at least want to have two of them. okay? And the reason you want to have two of them is because we want to think about whether strategy A or strategy B is the right one. Now, of course, you could linger on this forever, but I think we're still in the mode of thinking that a choice is good here.